Hello YouTubers and welcome back to another episode of Vintage Diecast Restoration. We've got snow in our part of the country. We've got about 8 inches over the last 2 days and it's still coming down today. And I've been sitting on this video footage for a while. thought, you know what, i got a whole day inside. I should go ahead and get all my voiceovers done and get this out and get it posted. Uh, it's kind of timely since it's a snow cat. So... Uh, up for restoration this week uh, is actually one of my own childhood toys. I didn't have a lot of the original Lesney Matchbox as a kid. I was born in 1984, so kind of came much later than these after this, and I'm really not sure where the original orientation of this model was, uh, why or how it came to be mine as a child. I'm guessing that it was either my father's or maybe one of my uncle's, but... Uh, I do have very vivid memories of playing with this as a kid, and as long as I had it, it never had the tracks on it, which is pretty common in these models. I've got a few of them in my collection, but I thought it was time to restore my own. As with all of our restorations, we're going to start by drilling and tapping the post out underneath here. Uh, you can see the base on this model is really not in bad shape. It's got a few little nicks in the paint, but the silver paint on the, the Zamac casting is actually uh, weathered pretty well. Um, the top of the casting has quite a few chips, play-worn areas, and uh, I am probably personally responsible for much, if not all, of those. So to begin with here, we're using a, a drill bit just slightly larger than the largest piece of that mushroomed head. And you'll notice that I'm drilling very, very slowly. Um, I can almost take more off, but it's pretty hard to put it back, and I don't want to go too far with, uh, with drilling that out. So uh, just working my way up a little bit at a time, eating a little bit of that, uh, that mushroomed post off with each turn, and we'll uh, ease up on getting it enough that we can prize that open. Now, I've used a few different tools to do this in the past. It doesn't really matter what you use. Um, I really like, I've got this little screwdriver that actually goes with my Dremel, um, but it's got a nice, fine little tip on it that, that usually works really, really well to do this. And so that's what I've used here. On this particular casting, you'll see that it's actually held on at two points. So there's a, a little tab at the back, and it's kind of delicate because the tab also aligns with the tow hook that's on the back. So you gotta kinda be very careful when you take that off. Uh, we don't wanna bend or break that tow hook off the back. Um, so, you know, a little patience, a little time. And uh, this model is also kinda unique uh, amongst the Matchbox because the glass is just set in there. Um, the base casting actually holds the glass up and in place there's a, uh, there is a post on the inside, but it, it's not mushroomed. It hasn't been used to hold the glass in. So um, you can see this glass isn't in bad shape. It's a little bit scratched up. And I think I'm going to try this uh, headlight lens restore. I've used that on some of uh, my other windscreens, ones that weren't in too bad a shape, and it worked really well. Um, as you can see, our base casting here, uh, mostly clean. The only thing that's left to do is to drill and tap the center hole so that we can use a little M2 screw in it when we get ready to put this back together. Now I also want to be careful when I'm doing this um, and I like to do this second because I've already got the little divot from my previous drill bit that will kind of help me center the, the smaller drill bit. Um, you see I'm going a little bit faster here because I've got a lot of material to get through. I do want to be careful and do some checks along the way just to see how deep I'm getting. Um, I don't want to drill up and through the, the hood of the casting, and uh, I have done that on other models. So it's always something to be uh, kind of mindful of, cognizant, that uh, when you're drilling, you, you want to stop and do some checks to see just how deep you're getting as you're going through. So we're going to go ahead and drill and tap this out, and uh, then we'll be ready to strip. As usual, to strip the paint off of this casting now that it's all drilled and tapped, uh, I'm going to use a little of my citrus strip. And I've got a Tupperware container that I keep some of that in so I can reuse it. We're just going to put it in there to soak overnight. 
as I said, uh, I've used this headlight lens restore. Um, it's sold most automotive supply, uh, auto parts stores. And uh, it's just a compound that is formulated to work on plastics that uh, when your headlights get sort of hazy, um, worn down, they've broken down with exposure to UV, uh, this uh, liquid gets in there and sort of rejuvenates the plastic. And as I looked at this canopy, I, I didn't see a lot of deep scratches. Uh, this particular casting, I think, does a pretty good job of protecting the, the plastic canopy. Um, but it, it was sort of faded, and uh, this, the, the Lens Restore compound works really good to reverse that. As a final step to uh, kind of bring some of the shine back to this, I like using these really soft uh, buffing wheels. I've got a link in the description down to where uh, I ordered these and where I get most of my tools that I use in my restorations. Um, so you can look down in the video description for that link if you want to uh, see where these wheels come from. Uh, I think I ordered these on Amazon. And uh, I'm using kind of a, a medium speed on my Dremel and nothing else. I'm not using any other buffing or polishing compound very light touch on this um, and all it does is, is just kind of bring back a little bit of that shine and it really does a good job of making this look almost brand new and uh, really pretty pleased with how this canopy has come out the the lens restore and the soft buffing wheel were just what i needed to make this look like new Our main casting's been soaking in stripper for hours, and uh, I'm going to see how our progress has been on this. Um, I want to try to scrape off as much of the excess stripper as I can. Uh, it lets me reuse that on later models. And uh, I really like working with this citrus strip. As you can see here, um, this paint just falls right off of the casting. It, uh, it does take a little bit more time. I've used the aircraft stripper and a couple of the, the other options. And they all work great, but they also come with fumes and needing to make sure that I'm doing it in a well-ventilated area. I usually work in my shop. My shop is a pretty good sized room and it's got a garage door on one end. So I get a fair amount of, of uh, fresh air that comes in. Uh, when I run my airbrushes, I like to open that up if I, if I can, if it's warm enough outside. Um, but I don't usually have to worry about uh, fumes or overspray too much when I'm working in my shop. But uh, the, the fumes from the stripper, because you got to be so close to it, uh, I, I seem to be really sensitive to it. Uh, when I've used some of those other stripping brands in the past, uh, my nose, my eyes get a little irritated for a day or two after uh, I've worked on something. And so uh, about a year ago, I switched over to the Citrus Strip and uh, it doesn't work as fast. So I've got to be patient with it, but it's so much more easy to work with and doesn't have all the harsh chemicals that I seem to be really sensitive to. So uh, I like it, works well for me, and uh, would be something I'd recommend as well. So we're going to take this into the sink and get it rinsed off and cleaned up and see what we're working with. So our Citrus Strip did a really good job of getting most of the paint off of this casting. You can see we've got a few little areas kind of down in the cracks and crevices where there's still a little bit of paint. And my theory in that is I think when these were painted at the factory, that's where a lot of the paint settled. And so it got thicker in some of those areas. So I've got one of these uh, soft brass bristled brushes um, in my Dremel. And these are some of the ones that uh, I altered. Um, I've got a tool time video on these brushes and uh, they, they didn't have very good reviews. Uh, one of the reviewers or several of the reviews that I read had said that, you know, they use these for a few minutes each and uh, the, the bristles weren't held in very well and they kind of start shooting out and you can't use it on high speed, you got to use low speed or medium speed, and uh, that they just wore out too fast. And uh, I had remembered watching a tutorial video, um, not on die cast, but on, on something completely unrelated, 
where they had used these really cheap little brass brushes for their Dremel tool. And the guy in that video had made a recommendation. He said, you know, if you put just a small bead of super glue around the outside of this, um, that will help those bristles stay in there. It'll help hold them in a little bit better. And I thought, well, I've got super glue, so I'm going to give it a shot. And uh, so far, I'd say I've had kind of a mixed bag. Um, I had some that the glue just totally seized up, and it, it almost became uh, too stiff, uh, where I couldn't really even use it without fear of possibly damaging the casting. And I had others that just turned out great, and I've used them on two, three, four castings now, and haven't had a problem at all with them. Um, I also, I ordered three different shapes or three different sizes of these bits. Uh, you can see I just switched over to one of the, the more pointed, fine-tipped ones that would kind of let me get down into the corners of that casting. And uh, this particular type seems to have worked really, really well with the super glue um, and making those stiffer and kind of holding that all in there. Um, and I'm not sure if that's just the shape of the, the base, the little cup that holds those bristles in, um, or, or what. But uh, this particular shape has had um, really good results for me. Uh, one of the others really, I don't know that I noticed any difference between the ones that I added the glue to and the ones that I didn't. But uh, this one seems to be working really well. So you can see I'm just kind of working over some of these flat areas, um, some of these other little spots. There's some slight oxidation on the casting on this model, some of those areas where the paint had chipped off. Um, and just cleaning up all those last little remnants, those little bits of paint. Because this is one of my childhood toys, I really, really want this restoration to turn out nice. I want it to be just totally over the top. And uh, so I'm taking a little bit of extra time on this just to really shine up this casting and prep it for paint. So for our paint today, I'm using a Tester's Gloss Dark Red. Uh, I looked at a lot of the different colors, and uh, this one seemed to be almost an exact match to the factory original red color. Uh, Lesney used this color red on quite a few different models, um, and I, I painted other models, not the Snowcat, but other models with this, so I know that it's a good match to the original factory red um, from testers. Uh, the other thing I like about these little testers paints is they're cheap. Uh, I get these for less than two bucks a pop and so um, if I want to you know have six, eight, ten different kinds of red, different colors of red uh, that I want to work from, I can because I know I'm only going to spend a couple bucks to get another color. Um, as always I've got to thin these paints down so that they'll run in my airbrush and I used uh, the, the thinner that Testers makes to go with these enamel paints. Um, and so I want to add, usually I, I have pretty good luck with equal parts about paint, the same amount of paint and thinner. And the way I check it is with my little stirrer here. I use one of these uh, cappuccino frothers. Works really well to mix my paint. And if I can put that frother in and it'll buzz around and I, I don't have any problems with it, um, then I know that it's about the right consistency for my airbrush. If I put it in and that frother kind of lags and it kind of spins slowly, I know that when I put it in my brush, I'm going to have problems with that paint flowing. And so uh, I, I don't know if that's the, the scientific way to do it, but that's the way I've had pretty good luck of measuring if my paint is runny enough or has enough thinner in it to flow good through my airbrush. So now we've got this mixed up. Um, I'm going to pour a little bit out. I, I don't want to use all the paint that I have mixed, so I always keep a little bit back because uh, remember, this first coat is going to be a real light tack coat, and then we'll slowly build it up and get darker and darker. My final coat on this, I'll do a real wet, glossy coat um, because that's the, the finished paint that you're going to see. Now you'll notice as this starts going out, um, this gloss dark red uh, straight out of the bottle 
it's a little translucent. So as it's going on, it almost takes on kind of a, a pinkish hue to it. Um, and I'm definitely still able to see a lot of the casting through this. Now, when I started painting this model, that was really concerning to me because I didn't want a candy finish on this. This isn't a Hot Wheels, and I wasn't going for a Spectra Flame look. Uh, this base casting, if I knew was going to show that much through the paint, I would have totally polished it out and had something real shiny that I could work with um, that would look good under that kind of Spectra Flame finish. Um, and, and that may be something worth trying at some point in the future, see if I can do one of these in a red Spectra Flame. But when I got to this point, I started to get really worried because this did not look like the original casting. So I went back through my paints and I started looking at what other color reds do I got. And I've got just the straight gloss red. Um, and so I have taken my gloss dark red and I've mixed it in a little bit with just the straight gloss red. And I'm hoping that that will be a little more opaque. Um, you can see here, I, I went through my second coat thinking, well, maybe I can get this still to come out or start to be a little more opaque. And it, it just was getting too dark. And that translucency was not going away. So I knew I needed to switch it up with my paint. So that's why we're going over to this. Um, gloss red, gloss dark red blend, this, this mix of these two colors. Um, and, and that's another thing that I like about working with the testers. Um, when I invested, and I say investment because I probably spent between $50 and $100 on uh, all the different colors of paint that I've used uh, just up to now in some of these restorations. So it is an investment. Um, and, you know, if you're going to spend that much money uh, buying paint, I want to make sure that I buy all the same paints that I can mix and match, I can put different colors together, and the Tester's Enamel, it, it just works so well. Um, I know that if I grab six different bottles, six different colors, and they're all Tester's Enamel, I can dump them together. I'm not going to have any reactions. I'm not going to have any issues with it. So they work really well when I'm trying to mix up and color match some of my paints. And so really, this worked just great. And you can see it's starting to get more of that opaque look. Um, and this is actually really, really close to the original color on this casting. Um, and so at this point, I've got my final coat, my wet coat on this. So we're going to put it aside and let it cure for probably a day, day and a half. Um, and then we'll come back to it. So we are almost ready for reassembly. The uh, casting really turned out nice. I did, after I let the enamel cure, uh, I went over this with about three coats of just a clear gloss. Uh, you can see the original windscreen looks almost factory new. Um, I, I really couldn't be more pleased with how that plastic restore worked its magic on that. Um, and it fits back into there no problem. On the base here, you know, I didn't really need to do much to this. Uh, I did soak it in a little vinegar just to get the rust off of the axles. I did a, a slight touch up on some of the, the bottom areas where that paint was just a little more play worn. Um, but other than that, I, I didn't feel like I needed to uh, take the axles and wheels off or strip this or repaint it. You know, it was in mostly good shape. And so I'm just going to reuse it as is. Now, to put this casting back together, um, I, I noticed that the, the repaint on this, the paint's a little, little bit thicker than the factory original, so I had some trouble getting that rear tab down in there. Uh, but once that got in, all I had to do uh, was insert our little uh, hex head M2 screw into my drilled tapped hole. Um, I didn't do a color match on this one, um, just I don't know. Uh, I Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. On this one, I felt like silver screw on the silver base just worked okay. And so I, I left that alone. Um, but it goes right in, super easy. 
And uh, if I ever want to change that, if I want to paint it up in the future, I always can come back and add a little bit of that red color to it. But uh, overall, i um, really pleased with how this is looking and how glossy, shiny that top paint came out. Um, it, I'm really, really happy with that. So when it came to deciding what to do with the treads on this, uh, I've very closely considered just ordering some reproduction treads. Um, but I purchased several of these models uh, recently, and uh, some of the ones that I picked up, I picked up because they had original intact treads. Uh, unfortunately, these things are, are not something that survives shipping and the mail very well, and so as I got some of those treads in, I literally was pulling them out of the box in pieces. So as you can see, I've kind of gone through um, all of these treads. I have taken the time, the painstaking time that I was not going to subject you to in watching a video, and I have actually glued back together each of the little broken pieces of some of these factory original treads. Um, I always love to have original, use original whenever possible. Um, I think it's, you know, it's always more valuable, of course, to have an original piece than a, a reproduction. Um, but I, I have enough of these now from a, a few different models that I felt like I wanted to put uh, original treads back on this. I've got some other restorations that I've done, um, some other variations of this casting that I did order uh, the, the reproduction treads for, um, and the ones that my kids play with, I put reproduction treads on because they're gonna play with them. They wanna run them back and forth, and as dried and brittle and cracked out as these original treads are, really, they're only for display at this point, point. and so what better way to use them than on one of my restoration models that's just gonna go on display in my permanent collection. So I'm going to keep these two for uh, a future model, uh, maybe a mint condition one that I can find. So one of the last steps of any restoration, of course, is bringing back the original artwork. Now, this model had a few different variation types, but uh, for the casting that I'm doing right now, it would have had these white uh, water transfer snow track decals on it. Um, I got these decals from Black Square. Um, it took uh, about two months, six weeks or so for me to get them out of the UK. Uh, shipping was, was really a nightmare. Uh, first package ended up lost. But uh, I can say now that I've done a couple of models with some of their decals, these are really nice decals. Uh, they, they work really well. Um, I... I have been very pleased with the selection that Black Square has. They've really got quite a few different uh, casting uh, variations. They they carry the, the of course the Lesney Matchbox as well as some of the Dinky and Corgi stuff, um, and they've really got a lot of very fun customs as well. So if you've never heard of Black Square or uh, never tried them out, um, I would recommend uh, giving them a shot and uh, seeing. Uh, how you like their their water slides or their transfers. Um, I, I did notice for some reason uh, when I ordered this set, I actually got three of these in the set, and I only need two for the model. Um, and as I got about midway through the second one, I realized why they sent me three. Um, these things are really tiny, really finicky. Um, you can see my, I kind of get the shakes trying to, to get it on there. Um, so, you know, I think that speaks to uh, sort of their their business, their model. They said, yeah, we know these things are tiny. You're probably going to screw at least one of them up, so we're going to send three of them to you. Um, and you can see as this one, even as I started to get it loose, it started to uh, kind of curl back under the, the backing paper. Um, so very fiddly to get this down in there and get it straight. Um, and you want to... You want to make sure you get it, you know, with enough working time um, that you can move it around. But honestly, if you leave it in that water too long, your decal is just going to float right off and come off that backing paper. So it is something you gotta you gotta watch pretty careful. But uh, in the end, I was able to get these out and on. Uh, again, it's very tedious process. I use 
this little paintbrush to kind of make some adjustments in there and get it all aligned but man I can already tell what a difference that makes having that artwork in there now some of the other casting variations that I have of I have every variation of this model um, and that was one of the first castings that I, I wanted to collect wanted to get all the variations of just because of my own memories of playing with this as a child um, and one of the other casting variations actually has raised letters here and they're they're molded into the the top casting into the form and I'm not sure why or when Lesney made that change to go away from the cast in letters to the the decals or if it was the other way around if they said this is too tedious you know we're, we're messing up too many it's taking too long in the assembly line we're gonna add this to the mold we're just gonna cast the letters right in um, but I've got both in the collection and uh, this one having the smooth sides I knew would have had the decal so I wanted to restore that back to what it would have been from the factory so of course when we finish one side we'll do the same thing on the other side here so I like to put down a little bit of water on the surface of the casting and it gives me a, a little working time uh, once I get that decal down to kind of move it around get it placed perfect um, and then we'll go ahead and get it on and when I'm finished with all of these I like to go over it with a, a real thin coat of the decal set um, and that just kind of makes sure that that's that surface of that decal is totally dissolved that it's really adhered well that the edges aren't going to peel up or scratch off um, and again for something that's going to go on display in my permanent collection I know that that decal set is probably going to uh, make sure that this lasts forever and so uh, that's kind of a good last step uh, really anytime you're doing decals uh, best way to finish them off So here is our quick reminder of how this casting started out. Um, one of my own childhood toys, one of, one of my uh, matchbox from when I was a kid. Uh, very well loved, lots of high edge play wear, scratches, nicks in the paint. Um, the base wasn't too bad, just missing the treads and of course the wear on the glass and the windscreen in there. And here is what we have today and this is just an absolutely beautiful restoration of one of my favorite models uh, and again just because of the memories it holds for me uh, being a kid and, and running this back and forth through the shag carpet on my grandparents house um, pretending that uh, all that green shag was actually deep snow um, but this casting really just came out great uh, you can see I did take it a little over the top with the, uh, the clear coat on it. This one really has a nice shine uh, to it, but I uh, felt like that was okay, knowing uh, what I've put this model through in its previous life. Um, the treads on it are original treads. Uh, these actually came off of another model that I bought in an auction, and uh, when they arrived, they arrived in pieces, so I had to glue them all back together with uh, uh, tweezers and my uh, my magnifying glasses so I could see all the edges and make sure everything lined up properly but uh, just really turned out nice and I think still looks better than reproduction treads would be at least for a model that I want on display in my collection I'd rather have the original treads and of course the icing on the top the the cherry is 
those awesome decals from Black Square. They really set this casting off and just make it look amazing. But this is not how you want to look at this model. This is where this model belongs, out in the snow. As I mentioned, we've been having some great weather, at least for indoor restorations over the last couple of days. And uh, I knew I wanted to get this out and get some photography of it in the drifts. So thanks so much for joining me. As always, if you enjoyed our videos, uh, don't forget to leave us a like down below. Uh, leave me a comment. Uh, I do read all my comments. I'd love to know what you think I did right, what you think I did wrong. And as always, join us next week for another Vintage Diecast Restoration.